Hey guys, I'm Phoenix Gray, and this is Lit RPG Happy Hour, where I sample Lit RPG and alcoholic beverages. Feel free to drink along if you dare. Today I'm going to be reading a sample of The Crafting of Chess by Kit Falbo, and I'll be playing a game called uh, Itemized Drinking along with it, where I will have to take a shot every time there is an item notification. If you want to follow along, pause this video and download a copy of the book sample, the link provided, or you can just take a drink whenever I do. As a disclaimer, I do not read every book that I drink to. This is all for fun and to share, uh, spread the word about Lit RPG and these awesome books. Uh, having said that, let, let's get started. Chapter 1, Chess. Checkmate. I use a pawn that hadn't been on the board eight moves ago, but $20 is $20. I don't normally cheat like that. I'd been preoccupied with my big plans and assumed that since I hadn't seen him in the park playing any of the other hustlers, he wasn't going to be as good as he is. The glint in his eyes shows that he's seen through the cheat. He lets me take the money. The glint is in anger. If I had to guess, I'd say it is amusement. You don't play hustlers in the park if you don't want to get hustled, and this guy can certainly afford to blow twenty dollars. He sits there in a long, gray, and probably expensive pea coat, seemingly impervious to the damp cold of the morning. Just thinking of the coming weather causes me to shiver involuntarily. You really got me good, he lies. How old are you, boy? He speaks with a slight accent, one I can't really place. Seventeen, I lie. One year and one month till then, but at least the papers and ID I have on me back this up. Shouldn't you be in school? I shrug. I got my GED, and this way I make a little extra to help my grandfather. He's the only family I got. This is all true. I had even passed a GED two times to help reinforce my papers. Gramps always insisted on having real records just in case someone gets too nosy. I'm planning to pass it again under my real name, though old Pa said it was a waste. It's important for me to still be me. Tell you what, you beat me again, I'll give you $40 to help your grandpa. If I win, I won't even take a dime from you. He pulls two bills out of his wallet. None of this time shit, though, and you call your moves. I'll move the pieces myself. He definitely knows about the extra piece I sneaked. Inwardly, I cringe. Should have saved the swap for someone I know is stupid, and just and not just to try to guarantee a win for just a $20 game. I push the, the thoughts of my future plan out of my head. Sure, I tuck my hands under my lap. Queen's pawn to d4. Today I'm not at a spot where I need the money or charity. I'm more secure. I have a plan. This game is a last hurrah. If everything goes well, I won't have to make my way in the park. Plus, I've got my pride. I'm not just a hustler who sneaks in an extra pawn. I'm good at the game. Even without any skin in the game, I find myself sweating bullets over a few moves. Maybe it's because I hate wasting time. I'm sensitive to that. With speed games, I could easily have made what Peacoat Man is offering in way less time, too. But today the park isn't busy. I think the weather is keeping most folks away, though I see one of the park regulars who, with a sob story, will sometimes buy me breakfast. It's half an hour before I collect the cash. Good game, the man says, offering his hand to shake. I'm Saunders. Instead of taking, instead of shaking, I bump the back of my hand to his. I had learned the hard way about letting someone grab you. Even a handshake could be a mistake. Jay, I say, using my current alias. He gives me an extra 20 and a business card tucked in the folded up bill. Standing up, he looks around the whole park. You're better than this. If you ever need help or a challenge, give me a call. Then he walks off, leaving me to my thoughts. Which is mostly that the man is weird, and I have a challenge waiting for me soon. I get up, counting my money while it is still in my pockets. This isn't the first time I've gotten offers, though none so fancy. Half the local dealers will try to get you to work for them, passing product under the table while you hustle. A geek or concerned teacher will want you to join their chess club. I know how to handle them. Pa always helped, me, helped keep an eye on the local players while getting set up in new parks. Still, I've been a regular at this park for almost a year, so the new offer is a bit of a surprise. I can already see Pa calling it a lure for something other than chess and then ripping the card up, but he hadn't been here to watch the game and see that the man could play. So I keep the card instead of discarding it, because it never hurts to have a backup plan. I skip across the park to Betty's Buns, a bakery slash coffee shop, and get my usual small decaf latte and a fruitcake muffin for my growing body. Joseph, the police officer who likes to patrol the park, isn't here yet. I have them pay it forward, reserving a muffin for him, like I usually do to keep on his good side, then head over to the bus stop with my change. It takes two bus changes to get where I want. I get out at the edge of the poorer part of town and walk to the gamer's gate, which shares the parking lot with the dollar store. Like most game shops, they try to get cheap space to rent, finding that trying to set up in the more well-to-do areas can make them a bit short on space. 
I'm on time for its opening, but the owner, Mel, hasn't shown up yet to unlock the door. It's a school day and punctuality has never been his or any game shop owner's primary trait. A flyer for a CCG tournament covers most of the front door. I've dabbled in collectible card games, but they usually turn out to be a money sink instead of a way to make a profit, unless I buy or trade something someone doesn't realize is valuable to sell. I know enough to be useful when I accompany Pa on his trips to find treasure at the flea markets, and that's all I need to know about CCGs. It is the row of ten computers that interests me. That and Mel's lack of caring if I use them to play games that let me wager on the outcomes, something the law frowns upon. In Chess at the Park, you'll get $5 games, maybe $20 games if you're lucky. Online, you'll get some rich kid five states away willing to put up 80 or, or 80 on a 20-year-old shooter because he managed to beat all his local friends. They never even research how the best players play the game. One thing Chess has taught me is that if you want to be the best, you must learn from the best. Watch their games, read their notes, and listen to their advice. You do that, in very few days will you end up with a loss. My new plan doesn't have that crutch. Eight months and I've built a nest egg larger than, the, than even old Pa would suspect. Sure, I love and support him, but I know better than to let him know how much I really have. First time I tried saving up and he found out, emergency started happening and I need to contribute more and more. I don't blame him, but this time I have a plan to use my funds on. Pa may not like the saying, it takes money to make money, but sometimes it is true. Jingling behind me lets me know Mel has arrived. He only has five keys on his ring, but eight keychains attached to them. Everything from a police box to a small lightsaber. So this will be your last day before you abandon me, young Padawan. I let out a groan. Five months ago, when he heard I hadn't seen the movies, he made me watch all of them, even the bad ones. I'm not abandoning anyone. The lock clicks, and he pulls the door open for me, his green army jacket sporting dozens of sci-fi novelty patches he stitches on by hand during slow days. I see you looking at the site for that immersion game, Fair Quest. I've lost others to those games before. Not like I play games just to play games. There's money to be made there, even without the $2 million prize if you're the kingmaker. If my plan fails, I'll be back here in a week taking money from Warfare's call, Fanatics Daily. He gives me a little bit of a sad look. There's more to games than making money, and I sell games for a living. There's fun. Escapism. I pull out a 20 to cover access for the day and hand it to him. Winning's fun. There's more to games than winning. I'd also be lying if I told you I wasn't going to check out the game on tomorrow's big release when I'm not working. It's supposed to be some next level shit, and you should go and appreciate that. I don't know what to say. At best, this is a chance for the big score, and a legal one at that. The one Paul always seems so afraid of. At worst, my plan to craft items for some real cash fails, and I'm out quicker than I like. There's no direct exchange rate. That would be stupid. But you can sell crafted or in-game items for other players to buy at the auction house with cash, and Immersion Arts takes their cut. Tomorrow the game goes live. I've already reserved my Immersion suit. Today I just need to see if any new info has been added. The official homepage hasn't changed, so no new info. World's greatest yada yada experience. Become Kingmaker and win $2 million. I've already read the contest rules, all 20 pages of fine print. Gramps hates contracts. He says they'll sell you with their words and screw you in the fine print. He avoids them. I read them. Being underage, I had to make sure I could still win. They'll hold the money in a trust until you turn 18 if you're underage. Parents and family can't even touch it, which is even better because Paul tends to let money slip through his fingers rather than holding on to it. There is a catch. I need to use my real name, age, and other information. Old Paul would pack me up and take me to a new city if he knew that. I pray that my name will lead to his past catching up to him. Immersion Arts is serious about privacy, so I'm not worried. Best not to cause him any extra stress. After all, he's the only family I have left. I'm not done, though. There are already half a dozen fan sites and dedicated message boards up for the public, most of which are run by those former testers. Even these sites have nothing for me. Leaks from the alpha and beta testers have been rather slim and sometimes contradictory. The game economy of being able to sell items is key. That and using in-game gold to continue the monthly fees. That way they can argue it is free to play. They stress that it's not pay to win, a phrase that is anathema in the gaming community. Vendors don't even have that high a quality gear, so you can't shell out a couple thousand and jump ahead of everyone else. The greatest items will be crafted by players, and that is who you will need to buy from. I plan to be the person they will be buying from. It doesn't take a lot of browsing to see that there is nothing new. 
time to go back to making money. Well, not technically legal, there are several sites where you can wager your skills against other players, sometimes through cash transfers, other times through online credits or cryptocurrency. I know them all, and of course, without everyone waiting for a fair quest to begin, most of them are empty. I managed to wrangle one game where I bet 50 credits to the other player, smokey 97s 25 This matching site keeps player reviews and an anti-cheating system for their game matchups. Smoke can see me rated well above him. We play War Call, a first-person shooter with fixed maps. Each player has a team of NPC you can direct, and you get points if not, not your PC. And you get points if you, not your PC, kill the opponent's NPC. When a player dies, the round ends. It's best of three. I feel a little bad for schooling him, but at this rate, I would have been better off playing chess in the park during slow hours than here today. The second game only lasts two minutes before I blindly lob a grenade into a common camp spot, hoping to pick off an NPC and instead get him. How do you know I was there? He messages me before I never, because I never use the speaker and headset options. At this point, I often get called a hacker with a string of expl expletives. The site doesn't allow modded connections, so I usually just ignore my opponent. This guy is a good sport, though. Didn't. I got lucky. I blind throw common camp s spots to get NPC. Here. I paste in a link to a strategy video by one of the former world champions of War Call. I watched this video to learn from the best. It really does help. Oh cool, got any more tips? I link a few more videos and strategy sites for him. Maybe next time we play, he'll be winning, willing to wager even money. The next few games against other players don't go so well. It's not that I don't win, just that the opponents are pricks, insulting me, my mom, and everything else. Some people are sore losers. Most of those people play first-person shooters. I tire of it. I stop playing. Like many in the world, I'm anxious about tomorrow's release and don't need the harassment. Peacoat man had made my haul for the morning enough to make grandpa happy. I should just relax. Tomorrow will be work. Mel eyes me as I stop playing and stand up, which is unusual. You alright, Jay? Jay, right. That's my name now. And before that, Joe, John, Jason, Jim. Only Jay names. That way if someone calls an old name, me responding can be a simple mistake. I barely remember being called by my real name, Nate, because I stopped using it when I was six. Yeah, I guess even I get tired of winning. I flash him a smile. But even then, I know it's not in my eyes. Do you know what you want to play in Fair Quest, Mel? I can only casual considering I still have to work, though if the game cuts into business too much, I might cut back on the days I'm open. I'll be going crazy with Impractical Dragon Rider, maybe, if the leaks are true. I can have my artificial intelligence companion train and care for the dragon in-game while I work. I'm sure you'll min-max and try to rush the Citadel to win the prize, right? I shake my head. They haven't released enough on the game. I would be behind all those alpha and beta testers starting over for the release. Even then, it's too much playing the odds to manage to make it there, win, get the gym, and make it back. I'm going to be a crafter of sorts, see if I can get the real world money flowing. Mel snorts. Never pictured you as that. I see you crushing scrubs for their lunch money. You'll even swing for the CCG drafts if you think you can win and turn a profit. Maybe I'll burn out and be back here in a week. Maybe you have a rub you're not telling me about, Mel says with a wink. Well, only a couple hours until we do our CCG draft. It'll be a fair quest theme event if you're interested in. Nah, I'm going to go home early and get some family time in before the release tomorrow. Mel nods, and I start to walk away. May the force be with you, he hollers as I exit the door. This time I don't need public transportation. I just need to walk from the edge of the bad part of town into the bad part of town. <laughs> it's where rent is cheap, and landlords don't ask too many questions if you provide cash, which makes it perfect for Grandpa Stu. Though I think I'm supposed to call him Kyle now. Gramps has always had a fuzzy relationship with the law and whatever the local crime is. He'd piss off the wrong person or scam someone he shouldn't, and we would need to move. Once, a year ago, I asked him why he didn't just go straight. He just said he burned that bridge years ago and that no one would wants to hire an old man with no references. Gramps taught me to read, write, ride a bike, count cards. He taught me chess when I was so young that I can't remember not knowing how to play. He claims I managed to beat him once before the accident that took my parents. I cross the rail tracks, then I'm home. Home is off the grid, which is which in this day and age just means a shithole with no cable or internet and an absentee landlord. I'm pretty sure we can afford better, but we don't. Grandpa's chatting away as I enter. The faint, unintelligible buzz of words become clearer a few feet into the house. He's in real bad trouble. He's just embarrassed to ask for help and would be ashamed if you bring it up. It's just a small amount, $200 to a couple of loan sharks who you'll need to wire the money to. I force myself to stop listening. I hate that he's doing this now. He's the one who taught me to work chess in the park once I insisted on helping. He was never as good as, at the game as I am. 
He relied too much on extra moves and palming a piece in the chaos. He says it's his joints making him slow. He messed up too bad. He messed up bad two towns back. Picked the wrong mark, got caught, beat up, and his jaw and wrist broke. That ate most of our funds and caused us to move. I had to blend his lunch for him to eat through a straw. Now it's less hustle and more con, using a phone to convince people to wire him money, one step away from being a fake Nigerian prince. He finishes his transaction and stops himself from starting another call. He breaks out in a grin. My boy, I didn't expect you back so soon. Come here, give me a hug. I oblige, and he uses his hand to ruffle my hair like he always does. You know you don't need to do that anymore. I make enough to take care of us, and if my new plan works, we won't have to worry at all. He lets out a low growl. I don't like that plan. Not sure if, it, not sure if it's safe. I remember immersion causing seizures. That was a decade ago. This company is also paranoid about player privacy, so no one will know who I am. I know he'd throw a fit if he knew I'm using my birth name for this. The company's privacy policy means even he can't find that out. It's paid for already, and if it fails, I'll move on to the next thing. Not like you haven't had plans that didn't work out. He squeezes me a little tighter. I just want you to be safe. It'll be safer than work in the park or this neighborhood. I wince knowing I shouldn't have said that. I can feel a shame and a bit of anger. When I was too young to know better, it was fine. Now it's a bone of contention between us. We have each other, I say. It's okay if this works out or not. I'll take care of you the way you've taken care of me. Yes, we have each other, Pa agrees. The look on his face doesn't change. I shouldn't have brought up our lifestyle. He's doing the best he can. I pull, I, I pull out my take from the park and hand it to him. Let's order pizza for dinner. Maybe two. I think I'm growing. The pizzas arrive just as it starts to rain, and I'm glad I got home early. Gramps decides to get a few more calls in, and I take my share and hide in my room, grabbing an old paperback copy of The Queen's Gambit to reread, allowing the door and the rain to muffle the sound of the sweet talking. The rain is still falling as I fall asleep. Rain always brings bad dreams. It was raining the day Grandpa picked me up from school when I was six, with a hug and a ruffle of my hair before he looked me in the eyes and told me there was an accident and my parents were gone. It was raining a few days later went to, when we went to the funeral. We sat in the back, and he let me listen to a documentary on chess to calm me. We left the day after. In the dream, I'm at the funeral again, and instead of Grandpa holding an umbrella over me, the rain is soaking me. A fight breaks out, and I fall, hurting my ribs. I try to run, but keep slipping on the mud as a woman roars at me. I wake up wet, like I just left a dream, but it's but it is sweat, not rain. I hate rainy nights. All right, that's chapter one. So far, so good. I'm I'm, I'm enjoying this. It's a it's a very interesting concept. I didn't say it before, but I'm actually gonna be taking Jello shots today. Uh, the company is called Gelatini, and uh, there's a bunch of different flavors, but I'm going to start with. Uh, this one called Good Time, which is, uh, looks like Sex on the Beach. I don't know if you can see that, but that's the one. Oh, look at that. It's like liquid. It's not even like jello. Oh, this, this, this might be disgusting. Anyway, uh, chapter two. The immersion center is packed. Where it is, the place is booked up for months, and the company is trying to get another one set up quickly for back orders. Some of the people waiting are hoping to sneak in on a cancellation. The crowd is mostly men and older than me. There are a few younger players like me who had somehow got permission to play the game. Of course, our experience will be muted for combat and more adult situations. Neither of those aspects appeal to me anyway. Reservation for Nate Showfield. Shoefield. I know I say it fine. It's just words, but my real name feels gummy in my mouth, like I'm channeling Rumpelstiltskin. The agent looks at the paperwork she has on me. This being your first time, you'll need to take a quick calibration test before you start. Don't worry, it won't cut into your reserve time. They have me change into a full body suit and specialized goggles. True immersion these days is a room that moves with you as the goggles and suit provide sensations. Asia has some pods, but good luck getting them approved here. Cl closest thing to the pod experience is headsets, but those have heavy restrictions limiting play, so I've chosen to go the reactive room route. As it is, the most I can get is 8 hours here. I'll be competing with the over 21 crowd who can stay in 12 hours a day, which is even more reason I'd be at a disadvantage for a Citadel run. The reactive rooms are smaller than I thought it would be. Maybe seven feet by seven feet. They have me do some running and jumping. The floor moves with me, keeping me centered in the space. It's amazing. I barely feel it except for the fact my mind is telling me something is off. Last, they have me act randomly, trying to touch a wall for about five minutes. I fail, but that's expected. Calibration complete, the computer announces in a soft, pleasant voice that everyone associates as not quite human. To begin your registration session, make sure the goggles are secure and say, begin. I take a deep breath. Begin. Trumpets blare, and I nearly jump at the suddenness of the world being wiped away, leaving me in a black void. 
Shapes shoot through the air, forming the words Fair Quest. It's all very stylized. The I is a sword and the R is flaming. I reach toward it. It feels hot, though not uncomfortable. A rumbling baritone breaks the music as the narr narration begins, and text scrolls across the action scenes that play like a movie in the air. Fair Quest. The kingdom Luciana is in turmoil after the royal family is assassinated. Many bear the blood of the king, from poor farmers to lesser lords, but there is no clear line of succession. In the far reaches of the east, an ancient evil known as the Man of Masks stirs, awakened by its hunger for power as it senses Luci Lucania's loss. Using great magic that ultimately cost him his life, the royal wizard calls upon the gods to send their emissaries, those touched by gods, to find the rightful ruler and bring peace unto the land. The future Savoran could be anyone of royal blood. To prove their worthiness, they may partner with one of the gods' emissaries, the touched, and defeat the man of masks. Today the adventure begins. Meet your companion. Defeat the man of masks. By presenting the star gem, proof of the man of masks' defeat, your companion will prove their worthiness to be king. Are you, O oh touched one, the kingmaker? The trumpets start up again, and the words and pictures fade away. New words scroll in front of me. Welcome, new player. State your name to log in. Nate Shufield. Select your game name. A keyboard display appears in front of me. I've given a lot of thought and hope the name isn't taken. I type in chess and hit accept. It green lights and I'm transported to the character creation page. Select your race. I know the build I want, but there is still a lot of information about the game that has yet been released. I scroll through the dozen races listed. I want something charisma based. All the non-human races that have bonuses also have penalties to strength, like the halflings, or wisdom, like the fae. Neither of which I want to have a penalty in. I guess it's good old human and our two free bonus attribute points and free skill. Select your class. There are only ten base classes, but each branches out into dozens of subclasses. You can be a fighter monk, ranger sniper, hundreds of final options, each giving different abilities but also restricting how you spend your attribute and skill points. Feeling a little overwhelmed, knowing there is a best option that I will probably miss out on due to not having enough information. I take a breath. I have a plan. I'm sticking to it. I select sorcerer. A brief description pops up. Sorcerers are magic users who use their force of will to control magical forces of the land. Unlike wizards and mages, they do not need items, scrolls, or ingredients to help cast spells. They will a thing and it happens. Consequently, their spells are weak and prone to failure if will is lacking. Requirements, 15 charisma. Secondary focus on wisdom or intelligence recommended. Dozens of subclasses are shown after my selection. I fiddle with how to sort them, alphabetically, by recommendation, or by secondary requirements. I start by looking at the de dexterity required builds and see sorcer sorceress, duelist, or monk. Ultimately, I choose to sort by recommendation to see how they have ordered that list. The top choices all follow an aggressive fighting style, summoning creatures and letting them do the work, or getting strength from outside sources to make up for a weaker mana source since high charisma is needed to have your spells not fail. Demonologist and Blood top the list. These either use their charisma to help control summons or use the blood of their kills to restore a lesser mana pool. The next highest recommended classes are fighters who use sorcerous powers to help boost their combat. I'm still not seeing the class I want and start to worry my plans won't work. Then I find it at the bottom among the least recommended subclasses for sorcerers. Just above sorceress healer and below sorceress nullwark is what I want. Sorceress enchanter. I click to read the description. Enchanters empower the materials and items of the world, allowing players to fight the battles of the future. Sorceress enchanters call forth the inner nature of the materials and beings enchanted, where clerics inscribe holy symbols, mages transfer outside powers, and wizards combine special materials for their work. Sorcerers are the least common, and often considered the weakest of the enchanters. I groan a little. The designers are literally calling it a weak selection. Still, it beats having to go out and farm tons of resources for my work. The subclass also has a requirement of 17 charisma, meaning I'll have even less stats to pull up my mana. The two level 1 spells that go with it are Strengthen, which says it brings out the best in the materials and enchanted, improving all aspects of them, and True Nature, which can bring out additional benefits or traits and materials enchanted. Those will be paired up with the level 1 primary class spell of Sorceress Bolt, which I will never use. I hit accept on the selection. Next up is the option of spending a skill point to select a profession instead of a skill. There is a disclaimer. All professions can be learned, and there are benefits gained from doing so, though some are so difficult or dangerous that it may be nearly impossible to do so in the game. Be sure to choose wisely. 
I select it to see the options. Like the subclass selection, like the subclass section, there are several ways to search. Maybe because of the warning to choose wisely, one of the options to sort by is ease to acquire. I look at the easiest ones first. Merchant, sell stuff. Miner, dig for rocks. Jester, tell jokes. I keep a close eye out for the crafting professions as I scan the list. Most have very few skill requirements. You just need to do the work. Some, like sculptor and artist, require charisma. Smithing requires 15 strength to use the tools. I switch to look at the most difficult professions to acquire. Top of the list is Dragon Rider. I think it's a requirement for the Dragon Rider subclass, and I'm a little surprised it, it is even considered a profession. General, you must be cocky to pick that one. Shipwright, because everyone wants to build boats. Alchemist, this one is tempting. Probably has more to do with potions and poisons. Next is uh, Artificer. That is probably the one I want. I click to read the description. An artificer finds strength and power in creation and beauty. They can create and improve on many items. Professional requirements are any magic class. Benefits 3% crafting quality bonus, 3% enchantment strength bonus, 5% artification strength and quality bonus, access to artificer spells and abilities, attribute requirements 14 charisma, 13 strength, 12 intelligence. That's what I want. Point spent. A genderless gray character model in a loose-fitting gray robe appears before me. Just to the right of the head, the name Chess hovers in golden letters. To the left are the categories Strength, Dexterity, Constitution, Wisdom, Intelligence, and Charisma, each showing a base of 10. Human appears under my name, and the model changes slightly, broadening at the shoulders and gaining a couple inches in height. Attribute points, 16, appears and hovers there a moment before the class I selected shows up in the display. Sorcerer. Five glowing balls shoot out from the attribute points, reducing the number by five. The balls spin, twisting towards charisma, adding to the total, which brings me to the base class requirement. Next, the subclass enchanter shows up, and the same effect happens. This is followed by artificer, the profession I selected. In the end, I'm left with a handful of attribute points that I'm able to assign myself, four points. I assign one to charisma, bringing it to 18, and a warning tells me I have assigned the max starting value to that attribute. Thinking back on the smithing profession requirements, I assign two points to strength and the last one to wisdom. Each point changes the model's shape slightly in response to the assigning of points. The game automatically selects my gender as male. I'd heard of some guy gamers selecting female characters to get gifts from other players. I don't know if Immersion Arts wants to stop that or has other reasons. It is giving me the option to change the features. Some have been known to spend their entire first day doing just that, making it look exactly how they like. I keep the random defaults. I have work to do. After a series of accept, 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 golden words hover in front of me. Entering Clarion, capital of Lus Lusania. The room glows brightly and feels like it is moving. I'm thrown off balance, causing me to stumble forward and I'm outside. It takes a moment for my eyes to adjust to the change. The sky is blue, the day is sunny and warm, a clear contrast to the miserable weather outside the immersion center. Behind me is the glowing blue portal I have apparently stepped out from. I'm standing on a stage in front of a crowd of people looking, well, like they think I'm their savior or something. A slight breeze blows across my body. I look down. Shit, I'm naked. My junk's pixelated due to age filters. Almost as soon as I notice that, someone is pulling a formless white robe over my head. Welcome to the world of Lusania, cries a man in a blue robe who is now standing beside me. This gets a smattering of applause from the crowd. NPC, I guess. I wonder whether these non-player characters are running on a script or driven by basic artificial intelligence. It'd be good to know. If Fair Quest is as good as they say, it might be both. In the distance, I can see more platforms with portals and players stumbling out. I'm itching to leave because there's no point in a player sticking around to watch this. Then I notice a smirk on someone's face in the back of the crowd. Maybe they're not all NPC. As one of the touched by the gods, you will help protect and shape our land. We have assigned a companion of the blood to you. With your guidance, they may be the next king, Blue Robe says as he grabs the hand of the young man standing at his side and shoves him towards me. The young man stumbles into me. Hi, he says a little shyly. I'm Jasper, your companion. Now Blue Robe is shooing us, and when we don't move quite quickly enough, shoving us off stage. Together we stumble down the stairs. There's a flash behind me and I turn to look. A naked young woman stands in the space I just vacated. Well, I assume naked because... Well, I assume naked because everything in the important areas is blurred out for me due to the age filter. We continue walking, and I miss what Jasper is saying as Blue Robe begins to yell welcome again. I turn to, to my companion. What was that again? I said we were supposed to go down to the training fields near the southern wall. I snort. They're going to what? Equip us, have us hack at dummies, and send us to kill rabbits? Jasper shrugs. 
The response is amazingly lifelike. I almost reach out to pinch his arm but resist, knowing that's not the best way to get off on a good foot with the AI I'm partnered with. Pretty much, the priests are having each of us companions escort the touched there. I shake my head. No time for that. Do you know where the nearest artificer is? What, Laszlo? He's the kingdom's artificer. Even with the money they're giving out to you touched at the training grounds, we wouldn't be able to afford anything from a shop. Don't worry, I'm not planning on buying anything. I say with a smile. Now, where's his shop? Jasper seems stunned briefly. It's on King Street. I'll show you the way. It's in the opposite direction from where we should be going. Jasper leads. I take it all in. All around me, there are throngs of people going about their lives, hanging laundry or sweeping steps. Even some dogs and chickens are running in the street. I'd be hard-pressed to tell their NPC, except for the fact that no player would do such mundane things in the game. Every time I think my gawking has caused me to lose my companion, I look ahead, and he is there, walking. He's making sure I keep up by not moving too far ahead of my haphazard pace. As I catch up, I remember not to get caught up with the special effects and to get down to work. First, figure out how to use my abilities, then gawk. I don't want to regret not going to the training fields. I know that everything I'm seeing is actually display on the goggles I'm wearing. I shift my focus from my surroundings to the three glowing blue dots in the upper right hand corner of my vision. Not sure how to interact with them. I try to touch them and nothing happens. The game advertised new advanced display interactions but hadn't put out the details. I kind of flick my eyes to the first dot and think hard on it in my mind. Suddenly the classic health and mana bars display there, as well as ahead of me letting me see the name and health bar of my companion. No one else in the crowd has one, but I suppose that's because they aren't my companion, and I'm not fighting them. Maybe this will let me see players. I'll have to try this later. I will that when closed, and the bars fade away. I focus on the next dot. Most of my vision is assaulted by an almost transparent status display. It doesn't quite block out my vision, but it's certainly not comfortable while I'm moving. I focus on my starting stats, and they suddenly solidify like subtitle text, and the rest fades out. Both my strength and charisma have tiny eye symbols next to them. I focus on the symbols, and suddenly an information window pops up. I think that's actually asterisk I. Anyway, strength. Important for work and fighting. Every five levels, a bonus for strength and action is given. One bonus achieved. Then there's another I symbol if I want to get more information. That window closes by my simply being annoyed at it and wanting it closed. In the lower left-hand corner, there's an action log. Only one action is listed. Charisma influence used. Jasper. Success. There is another info tab there, and I focus on it next. Players can influence, influence interactions with NPC using their attributes. I read on for more information. By flexing, players can use their strength to influence situations. By placing their hand on their temples, players can use their intelligence to influence situations. By placing their hand on their hearts, players can use their wisdom to influence situations. By, smi by smiling, players can use their charisma to influence situations. I guess dexterity and constitution heavy players are out of luck here. I'll delve deeper later. Reading while walking is hard enough. Closing out all the status sections, I focus on the last dot. This time the skills display pops up. I see the subsection on spells and focus on that. This first bit describes the skills and how to use the info dots to delve deeper. I see a little tab. Focusing my attention on that causes the spell display to fade and shrink down to three small icons in the lower left hand side of my vision. The first icon, a purplish ball of flame, must be my sorceress bolt spell. The other two are glowing objects, but at the, this resolution are too small to tell what kind. I keep walking as I focus my hands and vision towards the sky. I don't want to hurt anyone. Then concentrate on the fire-like spell. Just like I did the other tabs, a ball of purple energy shoots into the sky. The crowd around me screams and ducks to the side. Shit. Jasper does an about face and grabs my hand. Hey, you can't do offensive music in the city. The guards will grant some leniency for you touched for now because you're new, but if you keep doing that, there'll be fines, and you can be banished for a time. He shifted into what sounds like a script. A second later, he comes off more naturally. If we had gone to the training grounds like I suggested, they would have taught you that, and hopefully more control. Sorry, I say weakly, giving a half-hearted smile. His glare softens a little. Just don't do it again. We continue, but instead of walking ahead of me, he leads on from beside me. I guess so he can watch me better. We walk in silence for several minutes. Not wanting to mess up again, I leave my display options alone. So Jasper, what made you want to be a companion? I wonder if he even existed yesterday. He gives me an uncomfortable look that leaves me even more impressed with the NPC. I guess it'd be nice to be the, the next king, he says with little conviction. I chuckle. You guess it would be nice to be king. There are thousands of thousands of companions for the touch who will be led into dangerous situations. 
Death will be more likely than becoming king. And sure, we'll look after our companions the best we can, but if we die, we'll just be reborn, not companions. Which means the situation's companions are being led into will be more dangerous than not. Come on, why did you choose to be a companion? You don't look like you're eager for the adventure and danger. I know the real answer. It's because it's a game and he is programmed to be one. According to the playtesters, bad things happen if you attempt to push that reality in the game. It makes people think you're crazy. I'm curious though, how does an NPC respond to things like this? He lets out a long sigh. It's a job. I was an apprentice I was an apprentice princess bookmaker until I got pushed out of that. There were no other jobs. Refugees from the east with more experience took them, then the military and mercenaries disbanded because the funds used to support them got diverted to supply the touched. While you're here, I have a job. I'm bound to help you in any way I can. You can assign a job for me and assuming some requirements are met, I'll be guaranteed a spot. I get room and board in a small stipend, which is better than sleeping on the street. Most touch will only be here a few hours each day and be gone for days at a time. He lifts his right hand displaying a thick silver bracelet with a purple gem set into it. Whenever our touched enters this world, we can get summoned to them. A little danger and not a lot of work is better than my other options. It is a surprisingly well-reasoned -reason response. I guess many of the NPC companions have similar sob backstories. Few are probably eager for adventure. Even fewer must be stupid or conceited, thinking they will become king. Don't worry, Jasper. I share your lack of desire to run headfirst into danger and the need for a steady paycheck. A few minutes later, he stops me in front of a shop that looks like... It has been splashed with as many colors of paint as possible. There are a lot of gaudy, shiny items in the window. There are bags, dresses, and daggers that sparkle with gems and gold. The sign outside just says Las Laszlo's. We're here. I don't know why, but here's the artificers. Jasper's, Jasper's eyes... Jasper eyes the door nervously, not entering. Maybe he's afraid I'll try to rob the place. I look at him. You can wait outside until I'm done. He lets out a breath I didn't know he was holding. When, when I enter the shop, a chime rings. From the entrance, I get a good view of the strange general store sort of shop. It's filled with just about everything you can imagine, from weapons to household utensils to clothing. A tall, older man with gray hair and a strong body stands in the middle of the room, adjusting a half-made suit of armor on a dummy. He has on a thick leather apron with pockets overflowing with tools, bits of ribbon, and pieces of metal. The fingers of his hands are stained a rainbow of colors, much like the outside of the shop. My plain white robe is a complete contrast to him and the bright, gaudy shop items. I give him the biggest smile possible, hoping to bank on my charisma and give him a half bow. Laszlo, I humbly ask for training to be an artificer. One of his eyebrows arches up on his face, and he walks over to me, carefully looking me up and down the way he looks. He looked at his dummy. His words come out clear, crisp, and precise, almost a British-type accent, except there is no Britain in this fantasy world. A touch here. This is the first day we welcome you to our world. Not that the whole mess of it matters to me. I wasn't expecting to see any of you in my shop for a while. You must have come straight here. Bold. I do see a touch of the talent in you. There needs to be more than that, though. To be an artificer, you need to create. As you stand here, I can see you have done nothing. Go and create something good. Bring it back here and I may help you. I don't want to see you until you do. He leaves me standing there and goes back to his work. In front of me, a quest notification pops up. Laszlo has instructed you to bring him a good quality item you have crafted yourself. Failure. Returning without such an item. Reward. Possible training in your profession. Do you accept? Yes, I say softly. The window closes and I turn and leave the store. <coughs> Excuse me. Jasper is waiting for me outside, watching me leave empty-handed. You get what you want? Yes, companion, I think I did. Do you know where the closest smithy is? Of course, there are, there's one two blocks that way. He takes off me in tow. In contrast to the artificer's small shop, the smithy is large, with multiple open forges surrounded by anvils and several smiths working away. It is set up perfectly to accommodate multiple players or companions working on the profession. I have no money. I'm hoping they will take me on without it. Jasper, do you think they would take me on for some apprentice work? He gives me a look of exasperation. If you're strong enough, they'll give you a crap job to see if you're willing to handle it. The pay is one of the worst, though. You could go gather horse droppings and make more. Don't tell me you want us to work there. Us. I'd forgotten that I need to assign my companion some work. Not that I don't have plans for him. He did say he guessed it would be nice to be king. No, it will be just me doing that crap work. So as my companion, what can I have you do, Jasper? Anything. I raise my eyebrows at him. Well, not anything. 
You can't tell me to kill myself or to go attack anything out of my league, he shifts uncomfortably. The specifics are covered as part of the training. You could tell me to become an archmage, a bishop, a member of the high council. If you did that, you'd be wasting my time and I wouldn't even know where to start. If you want me to be sworn to carry your burdens, I can do that. You can tell me to do something. I am sworn to try my best. You get me profession, I'm even required to stick to it, even while you are departed. I spend a moment pondering. Top priority is not to risk losing my companion. I'm going to need him for the final quest. At the same time, I need some time to figure out how things work in this game. And I know I'm going to need crafting materials. I have two tasks for you today. The first one will be for you to go around looking for small jobs people need help with. Carry groceries, deliver a message, paint a fence, whatever you can find. While you are doing this, I want you to be on the lookout for things I might be able to craft with. Buttons, leather, shiny stones, a hunk of odd metal. If someone offers to pay, say you prefer materials. If you do get money, feel free to give a quarter of it to the needy. What I don't want you to do is any fighting. I pause. Is there any way that assignment could come back and bite me? I add. Don't outright refuse any job. I don't care if there's a scary spider in the bathroom or rats in the cellar that someone needs help with. Tell them you'll see if you can find someone to help with that. Then go tell a touch nearby. We usually love that. We usually love stuff like that. So my job is to be an eccentric, he says with a sour look on his face. No, your job is to be helpful to the community and look for things I might find useful later. Do it politely and with a smile. You can be as grumpy as you want with me or in private, but I want you to leave a good impression as you work. I'm going to be busy today, so you can find me tomorrow and tell me what you did and gathered. Is there a place we should meet? He holds up his bracelet. With this, I can find you wherever you enter our world. Well, get started. I have some work to see about. I shoo him off and start walking to the smithy entrance. There is a half wall encircling the whole area and a small waist-high gate to go with it. I suspect to prevent small children and animals from wandering in. The whole area radiates heat and smells of ash. Four men with big muscles and one woman each work on different projects and the sound of metal on metal assaults my ears. I open the gate and go in. No one greets me. I am ignored until one of the smiths reaches a stopping point. He's a large man. Of course all the smithies here are large, but he's the largest. He has a mop of ash-streaked blonde hair and an air of indifference. What do you want? He pauses for a moment. Touched? I wonder if I could work as an apprentice, an apprentice some. I don't know why I'm struggling with that word today. Anyway, he looks me up and down. Can you pick up that hammer? He asks, pointing to one of the larger hammers resting next to an unused anvil. I walk over and pick it up. It's heavy, but not frightfully so. Then you can pick up a shovel. I need you to add coal to each of the furnaces until they all burn with a bluish-orange glow. I pick up the shovel. He grunts at me. You can't work wearing that. A floating ember, and then we've got to deal with you running around screaming while on fire. You're lucky we lost most of our apprentices. Ran off to be companions with foolish dreams of being king. Some didn't take their work clothes. He points to a wardrobe in the back. The bottom left-hand shelf should have a pair you can use. I smile at him. Thank you, Smith. He pauses a moment. A moment. Call me Byron, and now that I think on it, the clothes in the shelf above that one might fit you a little better. Their owner actually frequented a laundress. I walk over to the wardrobe and peek into the first shelf he mentioned. I nearly gag from the smell. Immediately, I get a prompt asking if I want to equip the soiled work clothes. I think no and open the shelf above it. Inside is a set of worn leather clothes. Inspecting them shows they have some heat and fire resistances. I choose to equip those. I really should smile more often. A quest box pops up in front of me. Byron has asked you to get the furnaces to the proper heat. Reward. Five copper and more smithy work. Failure. Leave before the task is complete and not be invited back. Do accept. I think yes and pick up the shovel. There are five furnaces I need to feed from a single mound of coal. I load the first furnace up until it glows the bluish orange glow that Byron had mentioned, and then move on to the next. After loading up the third one, I notice the color on furnace one is no longer the ideal blue orange. I sigh. It's a game. They just can't have everything be easy. Switching tactics, I move faster, almost running. I give each furnace a little bit of coal, with the farthest getting the most until they are almost the until they are all almost the right color. Then I top them off, making them all have the blue-orange flame. I'm panting a little as the quest complete notification pops up. Prove your worth. Quest complete. You will now have access to more productive work at the smithy. 25 experience gained. The whole process had taken me almost 15 minutes. To think. Instead, I could have been at the training grounds chasing rabbits and throwing dark energy balls at them. Byron grunts behind me. Not bad. Do you want to work on shields or swords? Swords, I say. More player builds require weapons than shields. He nods. You'll get six copper per finished sword, and you may keep one sword for every four you make. He points to a barrel filled to the brim with rough sword flanks. Start here and use the anvils on the south side. I walk over and pull out one, inspecting it. 
It's basically a long rectangularish piece of metal, flat along the edges instead of having any edge at all. No one in the shop is giving me any directions or any help at all. Each of them is working, focused on their own projects. I'd ask for help, but I get the feeling that if they were going to help me, they would have done that already. How do I do this? I muttered to myself. How about let's start with common sense. I grab a hammer in one hand and the unfinished blade in the other. I shove the blade into the furnace. A color gradient di display bar shows up, brown at the bottom and white at the top, along with different shades of yellow, orange, and red in between. An arrow at the bottom pops up in my vision. It starts to rise slowly. I guess that shows the heating of the blade. I wonder how to figure out the ideal temperature. There will certainly be a too cold and too hot. I decide two-thirds of the way up is good before I pull it out. A small plus two XP floats up, and I move the blade to the anvil. Do I just bang on it now? A ghostly hand appears moving up and down. I start trying to move my hammer with it matching the movements and striking the blade. Completely failing to line up nets me plus zero XP to plus one if I do it partially, and plus two if I'm successful in matching the movement. After a few hits, I see I'm just hitting the same place on the blade. I start moving it slowly, guiding it across the anvil so that my hammer strikes a path along the edge, which reminds me with another small, which rewards me with another small XP bonus. Yay, common sense is king. I work my way along the edge of the blade, trying to keep up with the movement properly. Every few strikes, they would add in a hesitation, making it difficult to match up. I almost finished making my way around when I notice the blade has lost much of its color from the furnace. I wonder if it isn't hot enough, and I need to heat it again during the process. With one more hit, a prop pops up. Crafting complete. I look at the sword. Its information displays. Poor iron sword. Poorly crafted. Poor quality iron blade. 20 durability. Damage 4 to 6 slashing. Crafted by chess. Alright, that is the first item notification. So time for this uh, super liquidy good time uh, gelatini. This is uh, not, uh, not a shot. Or, or not a jello shot. Uh, I have a feeling I'm gonna get this all over my narwhal hoodie trying to take this tape off. I don't want it to drip on me. Shit. Alright. This may be messy. Here we go. That tastes amazing, but the consistency of it is really weird. It's like a mix between, I don't know, it's not even like a mix between jello because it's not really anywhere near gelling. I don't really know how to describe it, but uh, anyway, it tastes really, really good. Uh, if the others taste like that, I would definitely buy them again. Um, anyway, uh, it asked me if I want my name to be displayed publicly as the player who crafted this. I wave it off with a no. That would be embarrassing. I look at my spell abilities in the corner. I guess this would be a good time to try them out. I cast True Nature and strengthen on the blade. Two small plus three XP bonuses float up. Now I check out the blade again. It now lists as enchanted, and the bonus is a plus one rending damage and a trait of 30% resistance to breaking. My heart drops when I see the next note on the item. Enchantment duration, one day, 11 hours, 55 minutes. If enchantments have a duration instead of staying, it's barely worth the work put into making an item. Might as well have set up a booth before popular farming spots and collected a handful of copper for boosting players' weapons. Stop lollygagging and work, Byron yells from across the shop. Angry, I grab another blade from the barrel and shove it into the furnace. I had a plan, and this is a crack in it. Already I've spent so much just getting to play the game. Booking the reactive room, arranging for a lunch service when I take my break, making it a rolling contract so I can keep my spot if I continue past the initial month. This is the gaming gold rush, and I'm going to be the man selling shovels to the miners. I'm not paying attention. The blade is approaching white hot when I pull it out. It doesn't even give me an XP bonus. This time, I just start wailing on the blade. It can take my frustrations. Bam! I could be at the park pulling in bills. Bam! I could be taking lunch money from scrubs at dozens of different games while working Gamer's Gate. Bam! I could be helping Grandfather, showing him the money I've saved up, much of which is now invested in this game. I let out a groan of frustration. A pop-up interrupts my, interrupts my thoughts. Crafting complete. I don't know when it got quiet, but Byron is next to me. I look at the item info. Terrible iron sword. Terribly crafted. Terrible quality iron sword. 12 durability. 3 to 5 slashing damage. 20% chance to damage the welder. Alright, so that's the second one. Uh, so this one is a uh, bad influence penny colada. 
it is clearish and also that same weird gel uh, consistency. Oh my god, I'm so scared I'm just going to pour this all over myself when I open it. Oh, this is so messy. Mm, this one tastes good too, though. Mm. Yeah, the flavor of these is, is really good. Mm. Yeah, I like these. Byron's hand is on my shoulder, squeezing. Not a gentle squeeze. If this was real, I imagine I'd be feeling some pain. You think this is a joke? You think this is a game? I hold my tongue to keep from saying, yes, this is a game. He takes the embarrassment of a blade from my hand and shoves it into the hottest part of the furnace before taking it out and shoving it into a barrel of iron shavings, letting them adhere to the hot metal. You will remake this blade into something decent, or I will make sure you will never see the inside of a smithy again. It's a new quest notification. Repair your shame. Byron has tasked you with fixing your mistake. Rewards. You may continue training as a smith. Failure. You will be banned from all smithies and Lus Lusania. Cannot be refused. Ooh, that would be sucky. I have one thought for that. Oh, shit. Talk about shooting myself in the foot. I take the sword. It's an ugly thing. Haphazardly lumpy from awkward beatings with clumps of metal adhered to it. Even the balance feels wrong, which for a game is amazing. I think about putting it in the red-hot furnace, but instead lay the sword in the anvil, grabbing more coal, feeding it to the furnace until, like with the first quest, it has a blue-orange quality. I place the sword in the furnace and watch the arrow start to rise. Last time, I let it sit in there way too late, but the first time, I think I pulled the sword out too early. At least that's what I hope. Once it is a little higher than it was the first time, close to the orange of the furnace, I remove the blade. A point, a plus three XP floats up, so better. Taking the blade to the anvil, I start to follow the edge of the blade with my strikes, doing my best to keep up with the hand. When I get to plus one XP with a strike instead of the usual plus two, I cringe a little. I only hammer the same spot twice if it feels a little lumpy. I get all the way along one edge, and the color starting to fade. I shove the blade back into the fire, hoping I'm making the right choice and watch the arrow rise again. I pull it out at about the same spot as last time. I get no bonus and wonder if I made a mistake. I cast True Nature and Strengthen on the blade. Nothing happens except for the same pinkish plus 3 XP I got the last time I cast those spells. Even if I fail this, I'll need to level up my enchanting profession anyway. I work my way back along that other edge. There is no completion notification, and the blade still doesn't look right. I flip the blade to the other flat side. Maybe it's only halfway done. The heat is starting to fade from the blade, so I shove it back into the furnace. Either I'm doubling down on my mistake, or I hope I'm doing it right. The first blade ended up complete after I made it around the edge, but it also but it had also cooled by that point. I know if I don't hammer it right. Lost in my thoughts, I almost leave it in longer than I should. I pull it back out, testing, casting true nature and strengthen on the blade, depleting the rest of my mana before I start to work on the other side. I don't reheat it again, knowing I can make it around before it finally cools. Crafting complete. I check the stats of the blade. Decently crafted. My heart drops when I see the rest. Poor quality iron blade, 20 durability, 4 to 7 slashing damage, enchanted, plus 2 searing damage, negative 5, or 0.5 second reduced cooldown after using combat abilities. Alright, let's see what flavor number 3 is. Flavor number 3 is hot date, cinnamon fire. I don't know if I'm going to enjoy this one after drinking all of those awesome sweet ones. Let's see. Uh, again, struggling to get this open. Oh, but it's so good. Yeah, I'm gonna lick the lid so this doesn't drip on me because this is not quite a solid. Yeah, I'm not as big of a fan of this one. It's not terrible, but I wouldn't want to drink it again. Ah, all right. I look for a duration, but find none. I got an achievement. Nature of enchanting. Enchanting's greatest strength is while you are creating an item. Plus one wisdom, plus 10 XP. I feel glad, but deflated a little. I can do permanent enchantments. The plan can still work, but with that quality, I'm about to be banished from working at all blacksmiths. 
Byron has been watching while I was working. He takes the blade from my hand and inspects it. So, you're an enchanter. I nod. He holds the sword out, looking like he's testing the balance. This will do. Quest complete. Plus 50 XP. But the quality was poor. Byron laughs, and I'm a little unnerved. You think we give apprentices good iron? You can pretty much only get a poor quality blade from what we give you. Those blades will be shipped off to the testing grounds for you touch to beat dummies with. Though I must tell you, because you're an enchanter, I can only give you four copper per finished non-enchanted sword. I'll give us a silver for the enchanted ones. That's to give you some incentive for not keeping every enchanted sword you make. Alright guys, this is the end of the sample. That was uh, the crafting of chest by Kit uh, Falbo. I've got to say I like this. Uh, one of my favorite things in uh, MMOs is... Uh, is crafting, like a good crafting system. Uh, I think this story is pretty unique. Uh, it's doing crafting without it being boring. Uh, I also like that the 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 parentage in this, the, the grandfather in this, uh, this particular instance is, uh, I don't want to say a shady character because he's obviously not to the main character, but they're both kind of have like an outlaw vibe going on. That's pretty unique too. Uh, anyway, again, uh, I like this read. Uh, if you liked it as well, uh, there is a buy link in the uh, description. So uh, anyway, I hope you guys have a good day, a good night, a good week, a good weekend, whatever time it is when you're watching this, and I will see you next time.